So welcome to the um, ZP and Palm Sense um, webinar. We think this is the third in the series. And I say we think because I'm doing it from memory. So far, um, if my memory serves me right, we've done um, analysis of um, red wine. Um, actually, no, we've done caffeine. Um, we've done caffeine so far. We've done um, glucose so far. And we, we like these webinars to be sort of, let's say, very interactive. We want to hear what people are interested in. So maybe in the comments or in the questions, say what you're interested in. But today we're going to do salinity, which is kind of nice because when you think about the caffeine work um, that we've done, for example, then you know, we used a lot of cyclovoltametry. So we, you know, we discussed the sense it's smart and its ability with the ZP screen printed electrode to do um, cyclovoltametry. When we did the glucose work, we demonstrated the Palmasense sense it's smart with a ZP glucose sensor and we showed using amperometry that we could distinguish between um, Coke and Diet Coke. So if you're ever wondering in the future and you're at a bar and you're not sure if it's Coke or Diet Coke, then as long as you've got a smartphone, a sense it's smart and a glucose sensor from Zimmer and Peacock, then you can answer that question. And today we're going to do salinity. So the sort of measurement of salt. And I think that's so super interesting. I mean, the most measured chemical parameter in the world is probably pH. But saltiness is probably somewhere there as well, because um, obviously, you know, you're interested in desalination for, um, for water. You're also interested in um, sometimes just answering what's the salt, you know, just in blood, for example, but you're also kind of interested in salt in food. So as I say, this is interactive. Uh, we had some feedback um, to the guys at Palm Sense. They said people are very interested in um, salinity. And so today we're going to talk about salinity we're going to talk about impedance spectroscopy and we're going to talk about conductivity. And I think now that I will do a sort of a gentle handover, and I think it will be to Lutz, but I also know that there's a few um, quizzes will be um, made available. So um, answer the quizzes when the guys kick in, but I think it's over to Lutz. So yeah, thanks very much. So I hope you look forward to this um, live demo, by the way, we will be measuring um, using the sense it's smart these um, three solutions, and I think we'll come back to us shortly. Thanks very much. Thank you, Martin, for the nice introduction. Yeah, I'm Lutz Stratmann, and I'm with PalmSense, and that was just Martin Peacock, surprisingly from the company Zimmer and Peacock, was talking to you. So, um, we would like to start uh, immediately with a little poll, just to see um, who's there today with us, uh, if you're returning or if you're here for the first time. So um, it would just be great if we start the uh, poll for that. Uh, so I'm going to move forward here and uh, today we want to talk, as I said, about uh, salinity measurements. We first want to start with uh, what is salinity and give you a short theoretical intro introduction. Then we um, are going to move uh, forward to the live demonstration that will be done by Solron, who's also, well, who's uh, together with uh, Martin uh, physically again, uh, because, well, fortunately, a few rules are less uh, during this time of the pandemic. Okay, so let's first have a look what is salinity. As Martin mentioned, it's a measure for the saltiness of a solution, which just describes how much salt is dissolved in the water. The units are usually grams per liter or grams per kilogram. Um, the latter is usually dimensionless because, of course, if you divide a weight by a weight, you get like a ratio, um, so maybe promil or percent. Um, as you, well, I think many of you know, but some of you might not be chemists or just not very interested in chemistry before attending that seminar. So salts dissolve as ions. That means before you have in your, in your solid a combination of um, charged and non-charged uh, molecules or atoms. And when you put them in the water, they're going to dissolve into the two different charged parts. And that makes the water conductive. So I guess some people of you might know this, that very pure water has very low conductivity, can even be used as an uh, insulating material. Uh, while ions make the water conductive. Then the, um, yeah, based on these conductivity measurements, so people said, okay, salt makes water conductive. So with conductivity, we should be able to measure the salinity. 
And so the practical salinity scale, 1978, was introduced, um, which is based basically on empirical measurements, and uses as unit the PSU, um, which is not always accepted in the scientific community, so be careful when you use it, but you read it in a lot of places, so now you know what it is. The most common salt that we encounter is sodium chloride, and you have it maybe on your table when you have dinner, or you, well, you, have sw you swum around it in the ocean. Okay, um, why would we be actually interested in salinity? Yes, you know, the ocean is salty and you need some salt for your food, but why are we interested in salinity from an industrial point of view, for example? Well, as we already to uh, told you, is the, um, it gives you, for example, the uh, conductivity, it influences the conductivity of your solution, it influences the boiling point, and it influences the density of your salt solution. It can also indicate purity um, in the sense that what I just said is like very pure water has actually a very low conductance because there's no salt in it that makes it conducting. So um, for example, um, if you want to have pure water, usually you have demineralized water, that means you removed all the salt from it. Um, for corrosion it's important because water with high salt content corrodes other things a lot faster. Then it's important for the environment, right? It's a different biotope if you have salty water, non-salty water, or a mixture of that. Um, then fresh water, I mean drinking water, is only available uh, until a certain amount of salt is in there. And of course, salinity is an indication for health sometimes. If you have dehydration, also your conductivity values in your, well, body fluids will change. You can see that on the bottom right, you can see the indication, just um, this, is, this is the conductivity on a logarithmic scale, and you see here indicated the range of certain types of water. Uh, with a thick line is the line between drinking water and non-drinkable water. And you see that, for example, a lot of like industrial used water, like wastewater, is, is not in that range of drinkable water. Right, concentrated acid as, as a comparison, and I mean, most of you know that you shouldn't drink that. Um, yes, and we have processed water and seawater, and yeah, just to give you an idea how, um, how the conductivity influences what we use water for. Okay, so how do we perform an electrochemical detection? Because all that sound now very complicated already, and you're like, okay, how do I do an electrochemical measurement? Well, if you have been with the previous installments, most likely you have been, uh, you, you now know that slide, but just for the ones that are new, um, you have a solution and you want to measure something in the solution. Um, you need some electrodes, so the interface between the solid conducting parts and the, um, well, and the electronics and the solution. That is uh, then, yeah, so you have the solution, you have a solid conducting parts, and behind that you need electronics to control it. So to apply a certain potential, to apply a certain current, and you need a software to control this. So on the left side you see like a general block diagram, on the right side you see what we're going to use today. We're going to use um, uh, the Sensit Smart uh, from PondSense together with the software. Um, PS Touch, that is an app for Android, and you see um, by Zimmer and Peacock who have a good grip of the uh, chemical part of the whole experiment and who are making and designing and developing electrodes. Okay, so the Sensit Smart, just to give you a short introduction before we move on to the more chemistry part, is based on the Emsted Pico, which is an OEM potentiostat module, that means you can use that module to build it into um, your systems and um, have then your own potentiostat um, in your own system without developing your own potentiostat. So you build, for example, a lap on a table or something like that. Based on this very small potentiostat module, we made the Sensit Smart, which is now like a USB stick size potentiostat and uh, it can actually perform the most common electrochemical techniques like cyclic voltammetry, as we've shown uh, previously in the, oh that was for the, oh, for which measurement was that? Uh, if, you saw, if you saw the red wine measurement, that is possible. Oh, sorry, sorry guys, we have, it seems they're an emergency. Okay, it's gone. <laughs> okay, um, so, um, where was that? Yeah, so cyclic voltammetry we've seen, we've seen chronoamperometry, and today we're going to look at electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. All right, 
Okay, let's have a closer look at electrochemical impedance spectroscopy because it is a very popular technique but also a very complex one so some people might struggle with it. Um, what, you, what we do is we apply a potential wave, in a, a sine wave, and then we measure the current reply. And um, usually you try to have a system or you need a system where the response is linear so you always also get a sine wave back. From these two um, waves you can calculate the impedance Z and you can calculate the phase shift uh, phi which is then read from the uh, which is read from the time shift of the two curves. Um, both values are actually calculated in the software so you don't have to do it manually you don't get the two waves no you get immediately the impedance and the phase shift. Um, usually what we do in electrochemistry is, um, because some people might know this technique from electronics, but in uh, electrochemistry we need to superimpose um, this AC potential, this sine wave, on top of a DC potential that we are applying. Okay, usually you try to find an area where you get a very sensitive signal. This is indicated on the bottom left where you have like a, um, the black curve is basically the Nernst equation and then the blue waves are the potential and you see that if we apply a very small potential amplitude at a very sensitive part of the IV curve we get a very good current response and this makes this a very sensitive technique. What you usually do is, and this is why it's called spectroscopy, is you scan the frequency and then you look at the responses at different frequencies. Today we're just going to use a single frequency and I will show you in a minute why. Um, popular plot options, by the way, if you can imagine like if you measure now the impedance, if you measure the phase shift and if you are um, then calculating, for example, from that the imaginary and the real part of the impedance, you have like a lot of data that you can plot and need to plot. So there are different plot options that people prefer. In electrochemistry you find a lot the Nyquist plot, which is the negative imaginary impedance versus the real impedance or the border plot, which is the logarithmic impedance versus the logarithmic frequency and the phase shift versus the logarithmic frequency. Um, so here you see the two plots, the border plot, which has actually two curves in one, as I said, with the phase shift and the logarithmic impedance, while the Nyquist plot is just one graph. Okay. Um, this is a very interface sensitive technique and little uh, changes on the interface already induce drastic changes of the shape of, for example, the Nyquist plot. So you can see like water uptake in organic coatings, um, you can see like if the surface is corroding, but you can also see interaction between biomolecules. You can use equivalent circuit fitting to extract the contribution of single elements. Uh, that means we try to replace our electrochemical system with an electronic circuit that behaves in the same way. I will show you that in a minute as well. And then you can fit the data and this way extract the contribution of different single components. Right, this way you can, as I mentioned, detect corrosion before it's visible. You can check on coatings, as I said, for example, inorganic coatings and the water uptake, or organic coatings and the water uptake as well. Um, you have label-free immunosensors, that means, as I said, interaction of body molecules at the surface. So, for example, um, if you have a DNA measurement, you can um, skip the PCR to attach your electrochemical uh, label, so your redox label and instead using impedance spectroscopy and just see the interaction. Unfortunately, this technique is slightly complex, so if you want to give it to end users for direct usage, you often need like a special surface a so software that is completely processing this data for you immediately. Okay, today we want to measure uh, conductivity to then correlate that with salinity, and we can do that um, by first representing our, uh, well, by thinking about ourselves first, um, if you think about it as an equivalent circuit, it looks a bit like you see it on the left side. And I'm not going too much into detail, but what I want to say is, at high frequencies, the solution resistance is the main contribution. The solution resistance is the one that's now in the right circle, that is this resistor. And if we have high frequencies, most of the currents will go through the capacitor, because a capacitor has, as at high frequencies, a very low uh, impedance, and so most of the current will go through this resistor R1, and through the capacitor C1 that basically has no contribution to the impedance. 
Okay, then we talked about conductivity a lot, but actually what you get is when you measure the resistance and you have the N inverse, you get the conductance. Um, for AC voltages, if you're like very strict, um, the inverse of so one divided by Z would be the admittance, right? But today, as I said, we're going basically to extract only this resistance so we can work with the resistance and don't have to work with the, um, but we can work with the resistance, turn it into conductance and don't have to go the way through the admittance. Okay, so the conductance that you measure depends on the cross section and length um, of the solution where the current is passing through, just like it would be in a cable, right? You know the concept of resistance in a cable, and uh, um, well, the same is true for conductance in a cable and in solutions. Um, you can normalize your conductance to get the conductivity. For that, um, we have the cell constant. This is something you can calculate rather easily for the classic setup. Of, uh, well, of a conductivity measurement. There you have two parallel plates and you know the cross section where your current is passing through because they have the same area of the plates and you know the way or distance your current is traveling by the length between the two plates. And this way you can calculate a cell constant that basically normalizes your conductance to area and length. And then you get the conductivity, which is a solution property specific for the solution. Okay, but um, yeah, and then I said the salinity correlates with the conductivity. And we usually assume that sodium chloride is the dominant salt for most um, naturally appearing um, water sources. Okay, this was now the classic setup. You have two plates and there are quite a number of probes that use that. And you see that here on the bottom right, the little picture, and you see the orange curve, how the uh, conductivity behaves over, um, um, so how the signal from your um, probe behaves compared to the conductivity of the solution, right? Take care, these are both logarithmic scales. Um, the classic probes um, are a bit, big and don't have always optimized cell constant. And Zimmer and Peacock is of course very good at designing electrodes. So they designed an electrode for conductivity measurements that has a very low cell constant by providing a lot of area for the, um, for the current to travel through and have low distance between the two um, electrodes where the current is traveling. Okay, and with that small cell constant you could actually see um, that you get a pe better um, correlation between, um, well, a better longer linear correlation between the signal and the resistance of the solution. So while the probe is like giving up in ranges of, uh, well, that would be like then most likely like 50,000 uh, uh, ohms, so 50 kilo ohms, um, the Zimmer and Peacock electrode goes all the way to the 100 kilo ohms in a linear fashion on a logarithmic scale, which is really helpful if you want to make especially software that automates all of this. Right, the cell constant in these kind of situations with the more complex cells is usually empirically evaluated and not calculated, it's just easier. Okay, um, you can find on the Zimmer and Peacock website, by the way, a calculator to even calculate the uh, osmolarity, which is, for example, a popular um, measurement for biologists if they talk about conductivity and salt concentration, etc. And um, this is really helpful, but there has um, a limitation. It assumes that the conductivity is only based on sodium chloride, which is true for many situations and it will serve perfectly your purpose. So just visit the website of Zimmer and Peacock shown at the bottom here if you want to easily uh, calculate from your measured conductivity your, um, well, the sodium chloride concentration and the osmolarity. As I said, assuming that all conductivity is contributed from the sodium chloride, if you actually want to measure the real, for example, chloride concentration or real sodium concentration, you would have to work with an ion selective electrode. Uh, Zimmer and Peacock, of course, has also a solution for that, for the ion selective electrodes. And just uh, that would be a great point to all, you know, we're towards the end of the theory part, so to, guide, to wake you guys a bit up. I have another poll. I wonder if you did already work with ion selective electrodes. And so we have a poll for that running also right now, right? The most um, popular 
iron selective electrode is usually pH, but of course there are other ones, like for wounds it's interested to know the sodium or um, potassium content, but there are, very, there are also um, other types of iron selective electrodes. If you want to tell us uh, which, which iron selective electrode you worked, and it's not in the list, so it's the yes, I worked with another one, uh, just put it in the chat what it is and then we can, we can later look at what you've done and then think maybe that's an interesting topic to talk about in a later webinar as well. Okay. Um, yes, so I am now looking at RD to see um, if we have good progress at the poll, if we're like, should we already move on? Is that fine, the poll? Uh, yeah, just a few more, so have 40 more seconds for the poll to end. And we see a lot of questions coming in, so thank you all for responding. Ooh, wow. wow. So, so we already have a lot of questions, that's really good. And we didn't even have done the live demonstration. I think Soul Run is really uh, impatiently waiting to finally show us uh, what you can do with the uh, Zimmer and Pico conductivity sensor and uh, the Sensit Smart. Um, yes, so we just wait for the poll to finish. Coming in, are they come, are people asking about new applications or just about impedance in general, RD? Uh, yeah, we have uh, uh, one question one about question the sensor smart and an existing sensor. And this is, I think, a good question uh, to answer after the demo. Cool. I must I must make a personal comment. I was pretty amazed when I realized the sensor smart could do impedance spectroscopy. I, I don't really believe it because an impedance spectrometer should be about this big you know, in terms of height and depth, and it should really weigh a, a lot. So I was a little, I'm, I'm a little bit surprised that it does it, but it does it. So congratulations to Palm Sense on pulling that one off. Yeah, I mean, I have to say like spectroscopy that was possible because we had a close cooperation with uh, the company Analog Devices. It's a big company for making uh, electronic components and they have to developed a special chip for that. And uh, yeah, so we've used that to make this very small uh, and powerful potentiostat. And I think this is really one of the main, um, well, advantages that it, that it has. It has impedance spectroscopy at that size. And that will be, uh, well, I think this is really outstanding. And I'm really excited to see all these people who finally can make the, um, yeah, label-free immunosensors. I think this is one of the most exciting applications for that. Um, if, you, if you think you get enough DNA and you can do without a PCR, an electrochemical-based uh, DNA detection, for example, I think this is a, a really good thing. Also, I know people who test with impedance spectroscopy for Ebola or tuberculosis, and tuberculosis is still uh, really widespread in, in a lot of countries. And so having, having a point of care test that you can just pull out of your t pocket and do, I, I think the, these are a, a exciting, exciting times for electrochemists. All right, and before we, we continue, uh, continue the uh, demonstration, I would like to uh, tell everyone that if they have any questions, you can write them in a the chat, you can write them in a public chat or a private chat, and then we will answer your questions after the demonstration. All right, and now it's time to go to Sauron for the demonstration. Okay, so my name is Solren, um, and I will demonstrate to you how um, we are uh, measuring using an impedance spectro spectro spectrometer yes. yeah, uh, for a uh, sodium chloride solution with different concentrations. So this is the really neat small um, palm sense, um, uh, sense smart that we've been talking about. And it's connected with an adapter to one of the sensors from uh, Simran Peacock. Um, so we will insert that into, into a smartphone. Um, it's probably worth saying, it's a small little comment as, as um, Solron does that, but if you're looking for one of these holders for your smartphone, we, you can get a 3D printable file from us. We don't mind passing that on. Um, and as, yeah, we, we, we made, a, you don't need this adapter particularly. You can run um, impedance um, spectroscopy in, in many modes, but there's three electrode mode, for example, and there's also a two electrode mode. We happen to be measuring in two electrode modes um, today. And because we're full of engineers, we made a little adapter for us. We can also provide that as well if you're ever um, looking for it. So I assume that you're now seeing my screen. Uh, so you'll go to method and you'll choose impedance special. Spectroscopy, uh, yes. Oh man, that, that word was really hard today. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. 
Um, and we'll make sure that the AC is at five mil, uh, millivolts and we'll do a, uh, a fixed um, scan and then we'll do time scan. We'll also uh, use 100K frequency, uh, Hertz fre uh, frequency, and yeah. then we'll go to the plot and we'll start the plot. And now we're running it for 10 seconds. Perfect. So you see that it's running now and it's running for the lowest concentration. Um, so we're in about 13 millimolar of sodium chloride which is the least conductive solution that we have here today. Um, as as Solron said very elegantly, um, eloquently even, um, it's only five millivolt AC. So it's a very small sort of excitation. And we'll, you know, the current response is, is indicative of the resistance and the inverse resistance is the um, conductance. Um, so we, we're not doing the full, you know, Nyquist plot where you scan frequency and you get, you know, the real and imaginary. We're doing a simpler experiment, but this is a very powerful little um, instrument that you can actually do full impedance spectroscopy. Yeah. So right now we measured the impedance and we'll uh, switch to um, uh, switch to the uh, wait, uh, con conductance. And as Liz was saying earlier, you get the conductivity by uh, multiplying the conductance uh, by the cell potential. Cell constant. Cell constant. That's fine. And uh, for just for um, simplification, we'll uh, assume that the cell constant is approximately 0 0.5. It is approximately 0 0.5, but more like 0 0.4 something. But yeah, for simplification, we'll do 0 0.5. And here you can see where the blue line is. Um, that's the conductance, and that's approximately 0 0.88 right now, uh, which means that we have a, a conductivity of approximately, um, so that's 0 0.88, which is 880 micro, um, micro siemens. So the conductance then is 440 uh, micro siemens per centimeter. So we'll do the same for the next concentration, which is a bit higher. So this was a concentration of 2.67 millimolar. And we'll now do the same for approximately 11 um, millimolar of sodium chloride. So we'll redo the measurements and clear previous data. And now we're running it over. Again, you can see the impedance mm, as this is impedance by spectroscopy. And yeah, 10 seconds. Uh, we'll again swap uh, to conductance. And here the conductance is approximately 3.2 millisiemens, which is 3,200 uh, micro siemens. And uh, multiplying that by 0 0.5 uh, for the cell constants, we get approximately 1600 micro siemens per centimeter for the conductance. So you can see that the conductance is higher than that for uh, 2.67 millimolar. I just want to say, I mean, Sol Run is her background is quantum chemistry. So if you're wondering why her mental maths is quite so good, this is because this is easy for her. So, um, just as just way of background, but yeah, good mental math. <laughs> All right. And then we'll see if I'm able to nail the last calculation. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. So uh, here's the, here the concentration of the sodium chloride is 42 millimolar. And again, we'll run the um, spectroscopy, the impedance spectroscopy, and we're running it for 10 seconds yet again. Uh, so it's quite fast um, and you can deal with quite a lot of different par uh, parameters um, it's we're using five um, the DC is uh, five millivolts right now um, but you can also go for 50 depending on what kind of solution you have. Um, and yeah, you could always optimize the excitation to get the highest, let's say, strength signal. I mean, as Solar runs this one, I mean, 50 millimolar is kind of interesting because I think blood, um, if you ever taste it, you can tell it's about 150 millimolar sodium chloride. So um, 
the 50 millimolar now is kind of more representative of the kind of conductivity of blood. And th there's kind of an interesting measure in the conductivity of blood. If you do that, you can start measuring something called hematocrit, which is the kind of ratio of um, liquid to red blood cells. So there's a sort of medical application for um, this as well. Yeah, all right. So uh, here I swap to the uh, conductance uh, measurements. And here we have, well, let's say uh, 12, um, 12 milli siemens, um, which then by um, multiplying it by 1000, you'll get the micro siemens. And then uh, multiplying it by 0 0.5, um, you get the conductivity, which this time will be approximately 60,000 milli siemens or 6,000 milli siemens per centimeter, um, which is the conductance. And that was um, bigger than the, the, uh, the other two solutions, which had a, a smaller concentration. Um, so that's it for, uh, for the salinity measurements. And so it's quite fast to do. And yeah. No, well, thanks very much. I mean, it's quite impressive, really, that such a small instrument, you know, with a sort of, you know, a low cost screen printed electrode, a small instrument, a smartphone, and you can actually make sort of three measurements like that. I don't know how long we've been going for, but you know, five to six minutes, let's say. No, I'm really, really um, impressed with that. So in terms of RD and LUTs, you know, what are the kind of questions coming through? Do we need to take a poll? Let us know. P electrode would you uh, recommend for sweat sensing? So it seems a bit like similar to uh, salinity. I think the I think the question was which um, w what was it which material or which geometry for sweat sensing? Just say the question one more time. Yeah, which one. which P electrode, P electrode, electrode would you recommend? recommend? Yeah, so uh, at ZP um, we've got a bunch of electrodes. We call them the gold three hundred threes. Um, so AU um, three hundred threes. These will work um, pretty well. The, the, the big secret about measuring conductivity is um, you can buy an expensive um, probe for conductivity, it costs you a couple of hundred euros. You can buy fairly low cost screen printed electrodes. You get the same performance. Um, it's, a, it's a sort of, so, but you know, the, the direct answer is it's gold 303s. Um, we've been using it to measure things like um, conductivity of soil. Um, it's just a side quest, side point, but the um, the most um, knowledgeable person in our company on conductivity and impedance spectroscopy is behind the camera, so he's hiding there. But I just want to just want to put a shout out to Mots. But the quick answer is the gold three hundred three. If you Google that, you'll find an electrode that we can stand behind, and it works pretty well. Thanks, Aldi. All right, all right. Thanks. Uh, Lutz, I also have a question for you. Um, so there's a customer who already has a sensor smart and he also has a, and this time a BVT gold SPE uh, with silver silver chloride. Um, would it be possible to do a similar measurement uh, like we just demoed? I think it, it would be possible. Um, we had customers who ha wanted to optimize towards the conductivity measurement and they got the advice from that manufacturer, so BVT, to work with a different geometry that is a bit similar to what Zimmer and Peacock presented today. So with the Zimmer and Peacock electrode, you saw that it was like kind of a spiral, this design. And uh, this is similar to what you find in other places. It's called an interdigitated electrode. Um, that is usually like uh, small fingers of electrodes that are like little like, inter like interlocked without touching, of course. And uh, the manufacturer themselves rather suggest to use these type of electrodes than the, um, than the one um, that you suggested right now, the A, which I guess is the AC1 design. And um, yeah, so they, they do not recommend it for it. I have, well, what I've seen from Zimmer and Peacock's research, because they have tested it with these classic ele uh, electrode designs uh, that they have as well, and it did work. Uh, I don't know in detail like what, what additionally um, errors you get and how long it is stable. I've not done extensive measurements on that. Um, 
but usually BVT themselves, they suggest a different electrode. They suggest these intergigitated electrodes. All right, thank you. Um, and another one, Lutz. Uh, does the AES signal that you uh, measure on the sensor smart, does it need to be calibrated prior to, uh, to do some analysis based on standard reading? It already comes calibrated, so you don't need to do a calibration yourself. However, if you feel um, that you're not sure if it reaches the accuracy that you require, you can, of course, use the dummy cell that you get together with the Sensit Smart and test if it delivers the correct values. Um, or you can even design your own circuits and, and do, do a test measurement. But it comes already calibrated and tested for different uh, impedances. Um, maybe this is necessary, mm, a good question, if, you're, um, if you use special electrodes and they already come with like a very high impedance. But of course most of these types of measurements that you've seen here, and also I think for most analytical measurements, what you do is, because it's really difficult to understand all the influences and take all the influences into consideration, so you rather do a calibration curve with empirical values. So in case like just what you've seen with Solrun, she performs the impedance measurements. She would first take um, solutions where she knows the conductivity or the salinity and then um, correlates the known values with the signal she gets and then uses that calibration curve to make, to make the real curve. However, our devices all come already calibrated to the customer. Great, thank you Lutz. Um, and Martin, this is a question for you or for Sauron. Uh, it's about the sensor connectivity. Does it drift over time? Can you say something about that? Funny enough, Mots is, Mots is, I, th I think conductivity is actually a very, um, it's quite a robust type of sensor because as long as you've got two electrodes that are fairly identical. So if they're, if they're drifting, they drift together. So in fact, it's actually, when I think about it as a measurement, um, you know, nothing's forever. Um, but um, in terms of failure modes, you know, you often get the working electrodes, you know, deteriorating or the counter electrodes deteriorating. Well, in this one, you know, as long as they're drifting together and they're made out of the same material, the impedance between them is, or the signal is due to the liquid between them, not to, due to the electrodes itself. So it's actually quite a robust technique. So if I was to sort of say, yeah, what's the easiest um, let's say biosensor to make, um, you know, and get sort of robust values of. Is it a glucose sensor? Yeah, it's pretty good. pH, it's pretty good. Actually, I think conductivity is quite straightforward. So I think if you have a roadmap of things that you were going to do with your life, if you could find an application that was using conductivity, I think that would be a, a good place to um, start. Just FYI, if you're sort of unclear about some of these things, we do do a, um, a webinar every Thursday um, at 8 a.m. London time. Um, and we sort of answer technical questions there through our ZP forum, but just a quick plug on that. All right, good idea. Thanks, Martin. Lutz, I also have a question for you. Uh, are there any negative side effects that you know of if you run the sensor smart on its battery? If you yeah. let it run for a while, or if there are any, any other side effects you can think of if you let it run on a battery? Right, so the Sensit Smart itself doesn't have a battery. Of course, it depends on the battery of the device that you've connected it to. So if, as we saw today, when Solrun connected it to the phone, that was the moment the Sensit Smart was powered, indicated by the blue LED light. Um, as far as I know, it is powered or it is not powered. So if there's not sufficient current provided, it will not work properly. As far as I know, we have not observed that if the battery of your smartphone goes low, the device will still be running but gives false results. Um, I'm, not, I'm not aware that we have not uh, observed this in our tests here and we have not received uh, feedback from customer that indicates this. So um, yeah, so I would say no, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, except of course the problem is, I guess like when the battery is getting old and what the telephone uh, analyzes with the battery and says, oh, I still have 80%, but that's not true, it's, 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 it's 10 or 5%, um, then of course there, there might be interferences, but for that we would have to try to get, get, get a very aged phone battery and try to figure that out, so we have not done this. But this is a very theoretical scenario now that I'm painting here, so I, 
We have some. Exactly. So far, it <laughs> doesn't affect the battery of your phone. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Lutz. Martin, another one for you. Uh, does Simra Pico specify any equivalent circuit elements? So the R1, R2, and C1, etc. I think we. I think we might do. It's been a long time. Um, but if you Google Zimmer Peacock equivalent circuit, I'm pretty sure that actually we do have that kind of data on our website. So the quick answer is, um, I think we do have equivalent circuits on our website. Um, Mots, who's behind the camera, I think so as well, because he probably wrote them and I probably just cut and pasted them. Um, but the quick answer is, I think we do have equivalent circuits. Um, and um, yeah, so yeah, you can probably find, some, find something on there as well on our website. Martin, these are then equivalent circuits for your electrodes that, that take the surface of the electrode into consideration. Is that uh, what this is? An equivalent circuit for like sort of doing conductivity measurements. I mean, you know, the equivalent circuit, as you know, Lutz, is going to be so simple, really. It's just a Randall circuit. You know, it's just, you know, a capacitor and a resistor in parallel and a resistor then in um, series with those. But the biggest impedance is the is the is the solution itself so it's you know it's quite a simple you know there's nothing fancy about our equivalent circuits once you start putting a coating on that sensor which we don't have then you can you know start having um more complicated equivalent circuits and if you had a real redox molecule undergoing some electrochemistry then you'd have a new type of equivalent circuit but to be, i mean solron said i'm only putting five millivolts um let's say AC circuit on there. So if you're, at, if you're at low voltage with a tiny AC on top of it, you're having no electrochemistry. So the, the Warburg element is not there. Um, you know, so it's really quite a simple um, equivalent circuit. Um, yeah. Yeah, maybe as, as a that's remark that's on that, who's a bit interested in maybe also a few more complex corrosion-based equivalent circuits, you can also go on palmsense.com to our knowledge base. We do have there also some uh, information about equivalent circuits and equivalent circuit fitting um, because like um, our Windows software PS Trace comes for example with an integrated equivalent circuit fitting uh, module. So when you get our instruments the software will have equivalent circuit fitting uh, integrated. All right, yeah, thank you Lutz. Um, let's see, yeah, there is one more question. It's about AES, of course. Um, ah, yeah. Can a smaller distance between interdigitated uh, electrodes, so for example, two micrometers, uh, and a large, a large, and a larger number, as in, for example, surface acoustic wave devices, would it still work, or would it work even better than the with the sensor that we demoed? I think I think you tune the cell constant depending on um, on the on the the thing that you're trying to measure. So effectively, you're trying to measure resistance. So if you've got a high resistance, then you don't um, you can have you can have narrow you know two electrodes can be quite close together. The thing you're trying to measure is quite big, so you know you can get an accurate measurement. If your conductivity or sorry your yeah let's say your conductivity was higher. Therefore, you need the electrodes a little bit further apart, so you can actually end up. So it doesn't. It's not necessarily that bringing electrodes together improves the signal. It really depends on the fundamental conductivity of your solution. And you know, if you sort of you know look into cell constant versus sample resistance, then you can sort of optimize it. But there's a big thing in biosensors. Everyone wants to make smaller, more complicated electrodes. Sad truth is you don't need them. Um, you know, you 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 can have you know highly complicated inter interdigitated electrodes, or you can screen print down two rectangles next to each other and do it that way. It doesn't always have to be more complicated. At ZP, we're very different. When we're very interested in actually getting products to market. So when you're designing your electrodes, don't just think about the complexity of them. Think about the manufacturability of them as well. So keeping so things keep simple is important, Martin. That's a, that is a perfect way to end this, uh, this question round as well. I would like to thank everyone for asking all these questions. If you have any more questions, you can feel free to send them to either Palm Sense or Zimmer and Peacock, and we will be happy to answer all your questions. All right, so that's it. Thank you all for joining. All right. Yeah.
Thank you.